इन वाइट्रो फर्टिलाइजेशन आई वी एफ एवरी कपल वॉन्ट्स टू बिकम पेरेंट्स एट सम पॉइंट ऑफ देयर लाइफ ए चाइल्ड इज अ ब्लेसिंग एंड एवरीबडी वॉन्ट्स ए चाइल्ड बट एवरी कपल इज नॉट लकी एनफ और फॉर्चुनेट एनफ टू हैव दिस ब्लेसिंग ऑफ ए चाइल्ड इट मेड बी ड्यू टू मेनी रीजन्स एंड इट मे बी मेनली बिकॉज द कपल मे बी सफरिंग फ्रॉम इनफर्टिलिटी और सब फर्टिलिटी सो वट इज सब फर्टिलिटी सब फर्टिलिटी कैन बी डिफाइंड एज फेलर टू कंसीव आफ्टर रेगुलर सेक्शुअल इंटरकोर्स फॉर वन और टू ईयर्स इन द एबसेंस ऑफ एनी नोन रिप्रोडक्टिव पैथोलॉजी सब फर्टिलिटी कैन बी प्राइमरी इन कपल्स हु हैव नेवर कंसीव्ड और सेकेंडरी इन कपल्स हु हैव प्रीवियसली कंसीव्ड ऑन एन एवरेज सब फर्टिलिटी एफेक्ट्स अबाउट वन इन सेवन कपल्स investigations can be justifiably commenced earlier if the couple has a history of predisposing factors such as amenorrhea oligomenorrhea pelvic inflammatory disease woman with low ovarian reserve or known male factor subfertility the causes of subfertility can be male female or mixed The vexing clinical problem of infertility often requires extensive investigation before a cause is found. In 30% of cases the problem is in the man. In 45% of cases the problem is in the woman. In 20% of cases both partners have a problem and researchers also have shown that in 5% of cases no cause can be found they are termed as idiopathic cases medical and surgical management are complementary to each other and fertility treatment must be individualized to optimize the treatment result this painting shows a depiction of a couple if we can see then we will see that these two are couples and they have gone before a deity they are here to sacrifice a goat in order to receive child so for many centuries people believed that and they still believe and uh, they gave animal sacrifices and other orthodox kind of treatments to receive child because they become so desperate okay it was painted by me actually but nowadays the scenario is getting different nowadays people are more inclined to go to the infertility clinics and they uh, meet a infertility specialist who is basically from gynecology department and um, and they go to some ivf practitioners and ultimately they try to receive a child this picture is also drawn by me thank you so they go for assisted reproductive technology so what is assisted reproductive technology assisted reproductive technology or art refers to any treatment or procedure that includes handling and manipulation of sperms and ova or embryos in vitro with the goal of producing a pregnancy assisted reproductive technology or art includes all fertility treatments in which both ovas and embryos are handled in general assisted reproductive technology procedures involve surgically removing eggs or ovas or oocytes from a woman's ovaries and combining them with sperm in the laboratory and returning them to the woman's body or donating them to another woman in 
vitro fertilization is a technique of assisted reproductive technology for the treatment of infertility so let's go to proper in vitro fertilization then the topic of our today's discussion so in vitro fertilization or ivf is the procedure of removing mature ova fertilizing them with sperm and implanting one or more of them in the uterus at the four cell stage early development of the embryo also proceeds under laboratory conditions and finally one or more embryos are transferred to the uterine cavity so let's search a bit of history on february 3rd 1944 mrs miriam friedman menkin who was an american scientist obtained an egg or ova from a woman whose cervix and uterus prolapsed following the birth of four children at that time she was working as a laboratory assistant under dr john rock then on 6th of february 1944 mrs miriam menkin found that cell cleavage had begun which indicated that a fertilized egg had formed now dr john rock and mrs miriam friedman menkin achieved two and three cell development in their successful fertilizations and they elected to publish their work in a brief report science magazine the name of the journal published their findings in the article in vitro fertilization and cleavage of human ovarian eggs on 4th of august 1944 in 1953 a transient biochemical pregnancy was reported by australian fox school school researchers in 1959 dr min chuak chang at the worcester foundation proved fertilization in vitro was capable of proceeding to the birth of a live rabbit in 1973 the lancet journal reported for the very first time about the first pregnancy which was achieved through in vitro fertilization of a human oocyte in monash university by the team of dr carl wood dr john lytton and dr alan osborne tronson although the pregnancy lasted only a few days and would be called in the present time as a biochemical pregnancy in 1973 dr landrum shettles attempted to perform an in vitro fertilization but his departmental chairman interdicted the procedure at the last moment in 1976 there was also an ectopic pregnancy and it was reported by dr patrick stipto and dr robert edwards the first successful birth of a test tube baby Louise Joy Brown occurred in 1978 after her mother received an in vitro fertilization treatment. Louise Brown was born as a result of natural cycle in vitro fertilization where no stimulation was made. The procedure took place at Dr. Karshaw's Cottage Hospital in Royton, which is located in Oldham, England. Dr. Patrick Stipto, Sir Robert Geoffrey Edwards, and Miss Jean Purdy were the forefathers and mother of in vitro fertilization. Now, in vitro fertilization has an Indian connection to Dr. Subhas Mukhopadhyay was an Indian scientist physician from Hazaribagh, Bihar now in Jharkhand in the country of India who created world's second and India's as well as Asia's first child using in vitro fertilization. In 
India as well as Asia's first successful in vitro fertilization to produce Durga, also known as Kanupriya Agarwal, who was the second test tube baby in the world, was performed by Dr. Subhas Mukhopadhyay on 3rd of October 1978. The Kolkata based doctor got belated recognition 8 years later, but it was tragically late. Here is Dr. Subhas Mukhopadhyay sir along with Durga who was the first test tube baby of Asia as well as India and she was the second test tube baby of the world. So what are the indications of in vitro fertilization? Any disorder that impairs the normal meeting of the sperm and the egg in the distal portion of the fallopian tube such as tubal occlusion, tubal peritoneal adhesions, endometriosis as well as other disease process of female peritoneal cavity. Then there is also male factor infertility such as azospermia, teratosospermia, oligospermia, etc. Azospermia is absence of sperm in the ejaculated fluid. Oligospermia is decreased sperm count. So, this kind, this is a chart. Okay, it's a reference value of semen analysis according to WHO. Okay. And it is the guidelines of 2010. Then the other indications are unexplained infertility and also there are other causes. So procedure of in vitro fertilization. The procedure of in vitro fertilization embryo transfer or simply IVF ET has basically five steps. They are ovarian stimulation, cycle monitoring, oocyte retrieval, insemination and lastly embryo transfer. So these five steps constitutes IVF ET or in vitro fertilization embryo transfer. Before ovarian stimulation the woman will have to undergo extensive fertility testing. Testing will include blood tests to show the baseline levels of hormones in their body allowing their physician to recommend a treatment regimen that's suited to the woman. The women are also generally prescribed birth control pills for several weeks beforehand so that they can be confident about their hormonal clock. So the first step ovarian stimulation. Okay. The goal of ovarian stimulation is to harvest as many mature eggs as possible from the woman's ovaries. The physician needs several oocytes from a single ovarian cycle. Thus, the physician stimulates the development of multiple follicles in the woman by controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. Okay? High doses of gonadotrophin given, combinations of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that is LH or pure follicle stimulating hormone preparations are administered parenterally, basically intramuscularly or subcutaneously. Also drugs such as clomiphene citrate are used. Now, Gonadotrophin releasing hormone analogs or GnRH analogs are often used to downregulate the hypothalamo pituitary axis during controlled ovarian stimulation. Gonadotrophin releasing hormone analogs are usually administered before initiating gonadotrophin therapy, primarily to prevent a premature luteinizing hormone surge and ovulation. 
harvesting many eggs maximizes the chances that one of the eggs can be fertilized implanted back into the uterus and become a healthy baby now the second step that is the cycle monitoring the cycle monitoring is done to detect the optimum time to induce ovulation and to determine an adequate response to ovarian hyperstimulation to allow egg retrieval but also to identify the woman at risk of rare though serious ovarian hyperstimulation disorder A natural luteinizing hormone surge (LH surge) is stimulated by injecting human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, that is, HCG. Okay. Now, before it, by sonographic imagings, okay, such as transvaginal ultrasound, serum estradiol concentration, etc., the size, number, and serial growth. of the ovarian follicles are assessed at appropriate timings and only after that a natural lh surge is stimulated by injecting human chorionic chorionic gonadotropin hormone and ultimately multiple mature follicles and oocytes will be formed the retrievals are scheduled for 34 to 36 hours following human chorionic gonadotropin administration maximal tubule fell follicular maturation before ovulation okay so around 36 to 39 hours following the beginning of lh surge it takes now oocyte retrieval the third stage that's the transvaginal oocyte retrieval or tvor also referred to as oocyte retrieval or ocr is a technique which is used in in vitro fertilization in order to remove oocytes from the ovary of a woman enabling fertilization outside the body oocyte retrieval is done under sonographic guidance the patient it is done when the patient is under conscious or unconscious sedation a probe which is equipped with a needle guide of generally 16 to 18 gauge needle is inserted into the vagina through the posterior vaginal wall under local anesthesia follicular fluid from each mature follicle is aspirated and collected in a test tube with culture medium eggs are identified washed and then they are prepared for insemination this procedure normally yields 8 to 15 oocytes then the next step that is insemination insemination is the introduction of sperm into a female animal's reproductive system for the purpose of impregnating or fertilizing the female for sexual reproduction insemination in ivf involves combining eggs or ova and semen cells outside the body in a laboratory sperm sample is subjected to numerous washes and then it is followed by colon chromatography after colon chromatography is performed the sperm cells are separated from the other cells and debris in the ejaculate its egg inseminated with 50000 to 300000 motile sperms in a drop of specific culture medium and is incubated overnight this medium basically one can use a tissue culture medium fertilization 
occurs and fertilization is detected by the presence of two pronuclei in the egg cytoplasm after 16 to 20 hours can you see this is a two pronuclei stage okay these are the two pronuclei so it is a fertilized embryo with two pronuclei around day one so it is detected by two pronuclei and it occurs around 16 to 20 hours later on now if the sperm sample contains sperm of very less amount say less than 5 million per liter of semen then ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection can be done so when the male partner has very low numbers of motile sperm that is ideally less than 5 million per milliliter of semen then intracytoplasmic sperm injection is generally used and high fertilization rates can be achieved in icsi a sperm cell is injected into the cytoplasm of each egg in vitro under microscopic control it is also called as micro manipulation technique okay so this is an icsi can you see one sperm cell is injected inside the ova but in a conventional in vitro fertilization the many sperm cells are there they combine with the oocyte icsi is not exactly included under ivf but it is a in a way different modified form of ivf when the sperm count is very low conventionally both the ova and the sperm cells are kept in a petri dish under suitable conditions in a culture media and they fertilize that is one semen cell fertilize one ova okay now lastly embryo transfer so embryo transfer is the final step of in vitro fertilization in which the embryos are placed generally into the uterus sometimes into a fallopian tube of a female with the intent to establish a pregnancy after 48 to 120 hours of cell culturing the physician transfers three to four embryos to the uterus at the four to eight cell stage okay that is after two days or fewer embryo at blastocyst stage that is after five days the blastocyst stage at first embryo transfer was first done in 1984 it's also called as blastocyst culture and transfer okay this is a blastocyst stage around day five this is the four cell stage around when someone inserts the embryo then it is around four to six cell stage four to eight cell something like this and then at around five days this is the blastocyst okay so two cell embryo okay one cell embryo two cell embryo four cell embryo then eight cell embryo then morula okay then ultimately blastocyst so it is a human pre-implantation development the embryos are selected and they are loaded in a can you see this one they are loaded in a thin flexible catheter under ultrasonography guidance it is inserted into the uterine cavity the woman usually perceives and usually receives progesterone to support implantation and pregnancy okay can you send this the embryo has been implanted here okay it is an ultrasonography image the woman or to be mother is monitored by sonographic means as well as other means till her delivery the woman that is the mother as well as her baby is taken care of in certain cases the embryos are transferred to the fallopian tube during laparoscopy it is called as 
tubal embryo transfer simply TET TET the rationale for this procedure is that the fallopian tube contributes to the early development of embryo as it travels down the tube to the uterus can you see the fertilized embryos or zygotes are transferred to the fallopian tube okay like this so this is the IVF process if we see after like this and diagnosis controlled ovarian stimulation or ovarian hyperstimulation system then egg retrieval then semen retrieval then fertilization insemination and ultimately embryo transfer okay so this is in a way IVF process now success rate of in vitro fertilization in vitro fertilization success rate depends on many things about the age of the woman who is undergoing it and also other, depends on many other things whether she has previously conceived or not and other factors in any ways research says that in a generalized way the success rate of in vitro fertilization per cycle is about 30 percent in women under 35 years of age now complications of IVF what may be the complications of IVF multiple birth yes multiple gestation may produce uh, there was a case of Suleiman act in which the doctor placed 12 embryos in a woman and out of the 12 embryos uh, eight children were produced that is octuplets result and hence it was a case of multiple birth okay also spread of infectious disease there can be ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome there can be ectopic pregnancy that is pregnancy occurred at a different site okay during egg retrieval bleeding infection damage to surrounding structures etc can occur also prematurity also fetal growth restriction also placenta previa epigastric abnormalities prematurity means premature baby okay also there can be birth defects such as septal heart defects cleft lip with or without cleft palate esophageal atresia anorectal atresia and other complications such as antipartum hemorrhage preterm birth gestational diabetes mellitus depression hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and so on now modified versions of in vitro fertilization what are the modified versions of in vitro fertilization zygote intra fallopian transfer or zift zift okay so zift involves that is zygote intra fallopian transfer involves transferring the fertilized eggs or zygotes directly to the fallopian tube where fertilization occurs okay while in a traditional in vitro fertilization the embryos are observed and raised in a laboratory for three to five days in zygote intra fallopian transfer the fertilized eggs at this stage called zygotes are placed in the fallopian tubes within 24 hours that is after the sperm and the ova have fertilized then the zygote that is the first stage that is formed within 24 hours it is implanted to the fallopian tube we do not wait for it to go to four to eight cell stage we directly implant the zygote here so it is called as zygote intra fallopian transfer or gift now gift that is gamete intra fallopian transfer or gift thus gamete intra fallopian transfer or gift involves 
transferring the gametes that is the oocytes and sperm cells the oocytes okay the oocytes and sperm cells oocytes and sperm cells directly to the fallopian tube where fertilization occurs thus this variation is actually an in vivo fertilization rather than an in vitro one see as we directly give the oocyte and sperm cell and the fertilization occurs inside the body so it is an actually an in vivo fertilization known an in vitro one okay in vivo means inside the body in vitro means in laboratory okay that is outside the body so in gift the sperm and eggs are just mixed together before being inserted and it is hoped that one of the eggs will become fertilized inside the fallopian tube thus this variation is actually an in vivo fertilization even though it is said that it is a rather different form of in vitro fertilization okay the process used in gamete intrafallopian transfer and zygote intrafallopian transfer are closer to natural conception okay for some women who haven't been able to get pregnant with normal in vitro fertilization gift or gift may be a good idea because they mimic closely the natural conception in gift the eggs are placed in the fallopian tube okay rather than directly in the uterus can you say this that is the ivf zygotes which are placed directly into the fallopian tube they are not placed in the uterus with gift that is gift the fertilization actually takes place in the body rather than in a petri dish okay so the sperm cells and the ova are there so the fertilization actually takes place inside the body however in vitro fertilization techniques have become more refined and since gamete intrafallopian transfer and zygote intrafallopian transfer both require a surgical procedure that in vitro fertilization does not so in vitro fertilization is almost always the preferred choice in clinics okay this picture shows the advancement of in vitro fertilization i'm just uh, come i'm just uh, comparing in vitro fertilization to be a hyper robotic cybernetic robotic organism as compared to a say uh, normal organism so <laughs> anyways in usa in vitro fertilization techniques account for at least 98% of all assisted reproductive technology while gamete intrafallopian transfer and zygote intrafallopian transfer make up for less than 2% of the total cases this statistics are given by research okay i'm not making up myself now expansions so what is expansion there are various expansions or additional techniques that can be applied in in vitro fertilization which are usually not necessary for ivf procedure itself but ivf would be virtually impossible or technically difficult to perform without concomitantly performing this expansion methods so first of all pre implantation genetic diagnosis simply pgd or pigd pre implantation genetic diagnosis or pgd or pigd is the genetic profiling of embryos prior to implantation as a form of embryo profiling and sometimes even of oocytes prior to fertilization pre implantation genetic diagnosis is considered a similar fashion to prenatal diagnosis as when it is used to screen for a specific genetic disease its main advantage is that 
it avoids selective abortion. Esther method makes it highly likely that the body will be free of the disease under consideration. The pre-implantation genetic diagnosis allows the studying of the DNA of eggs or embryos to select those that carry certain mutations for genetic diseases. It is useful when there are say previous chromosomal or genetic disorders in the family that is some hereditary problems are there and within the context of in vitro fertilization programs okay so one can do this kind of things so prenatal genetic testing helps detects the defects in the genes of a baby okay now pre-implantation genetic screening or pgs so pre-implantation genetic screening or PGS is the practice of determining the presence of aneuploidy in a developing embryo. Okay. So what is aneuploidy? Aneuploidy means either too many or too few of the chromosomes. Okay. Thus the term pre-implantation genetic screening refers to the set of techniques for testing whether the embryos obtained through in vitro fertilization or intracytoplasmic sperm injection have normal chromosome number okay one can have to find it okay this is a female this is a male chromosome anyways thus pre-implantation genetic screening is also called as aneuploidy screening okay Pre-implantation genetic screening tests if embryo is aneuploid or not. It was renamed pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for aneuploidy by pre-implantation genetic diagnosis international society. Okay, that is PGDIS in 2016. Thus, it is also called as hmm, what it is called. It is called as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for aneuploidy or PGTA. Pre-implantation genetic screening and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis may also be called genetic profiling to adapt to the fact that they are sometimes used on oocyte or ova or embryos prior to implantation for other reasons than diagnosis or screening okay now intracytoplasmic sperm injection so we have already discussed ICSI simply here a single sperm cell is injected okay into an egg or oocyte so that the fertilization happens basically it is done when the sperm count is less than 5 million per milliliter of semen sample okay so I have discussed okay so basically it is the same like that of IVF ovarian stimulation egg retrieval preparation of sperm and then instead of putting it in petri dish with many sperm cells and one single ova what do what is do, it is done at under under very good monitoring a sperm cell is injected inside the ova okay through a needle and ultimately after fertilization after two days or five days, the embryo is inserted in the uterine cavity of the woman. Simply intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI. It increases the chance of pregnancy. Now, surgical sperm retrieval. Where the sperm quality is low but sperm are present, ICSI is required to help achieve a pregnancy. However, in the absence of naturally ejaculated sperm, patients will have to undergo surgical sperm retrieval. SSR can be performed under sedation or general anesthetic. Here I would like to mention that generally more than 15 million per milliliter of sperm should be there. Okay, uh, Around 1.5 ml or more should be the normal semen sample. 
and uh, when the semen sample that is the sperm is uh, less than 5 million per milliliter of semen then one should ideally go for intracytoplasmic sperm injection when it is in between 5 to 10 million of uh, say sperm per milliliter of semen then one should go for in vitro fertilization and when it is in between say 10 to 15 or 10 to 20 million per milliliter of semen sample then one can go for intrauterine insemination okay anyways if semen, a sperm sample is very less then one has to take up the sperm and hence sperm retrieval a fine needle is inserted into the epididymis or the testicular tissue this is the epididymis okay these are the testicular tissues okay these are this is anatomy of a testis okay so uh, it is in the needle is inserted into the epididymis or the testicular tissue to obtain sperm or testicular tissue with sperm respectively the retrieved sperm can then be cryopreserved or injected into the oocyte as part of a fresh IVF or ICSI cycle. Now assisted zona hatching or AGNIs, okay? Assisted zona hatching can be performed shortly before the embryo is transferred to the uterus. A small opening is made in the zona pellucida which is what is zona pellucida zona pellucida is the outer layer surrounding the egg okay this is the egg this is the outer layer it is the zona pellucida so what happens is that here the a small opening is made in the outer layer of the zona pellucida and ultimately what happens it helps for the embryo to hatch out and get implanted to the uterine cavity okay Thus, assisted zona hatching can be performed before the embryo is transferred to the uterus. Here, a small opening is made in the zona pellucida, okay, which is the outer layer surrounding the egg or the oocyte in order to help the embryo hatch out and aid in the implantation process of growing out. So, there is also a form called laser assisted hatching, which is a say a version of uh, say days assisted zona hatching okay so laser here we to in order to make this uh, this uh, this portion in order to cut this portion of zona pellucida we use laser okay thus laser assisted hatching is a technique which is used to mechanically thin or vaporize a portion of the outer zona pellucida this bridge or thinning of the zona is done to aid the egress of the blastocyst from the outer shell to the endometrium. Thus, the chances of sticking of the embryo to the uterus increases. And only when the embryo sticks to the uterus, then only it can result in a pregnancy, otherwise not. Hence, it increases the chance of the pregnancy. Okay, the Dola Bellucita, okay, this is the egg for then low energy laser beam such as an infrared laser beam is used it has cut up this portion and through it the embryo can hatch out and it can implant to the uterus okay it is uterine endometry now blastocyst culture and transfer blastocyst culture refers to growing the embryos in the laboratory for two more days at which point they are referred to as blastocyst embryos Blastocyst transfer simply means that the blastocyst embryos are transferred to the woman's uterus on day 5 in exactly the same way that day 3 embryos are. Generally, the embryos are transferred in 4 to 8 cell stage, okay, that is around day 2 to day 3, okay. But if one implants a blastocyst which comes at around the day 5, then what happens? It is a more say superior embryo and hence the chances of pregnancy increases okay in blastocyst culture and transfer instead of third day on fifth day more stronger embryo is put inside so that the chance of pregnancy increase so ultimately this is the main goal okay to increase the chance of pregnancy 
because this IVF treatment is only to institute pregnancy only. So if something increases the chance, then it is well and good. Now cryopreservation. Cryopreservation of embryos is the process of preserving an embryo at sub-zero temperatures. Generally at an embryogenesis stage corresponding to pre-implantation that is from fertilization to blastocyst stage. Thus cryopreservation is a technique which is used to freeze and then thaw oocytes, embryos or sperm for use in in vitro fertilization or IVF cycles. The advantage of cryopreservation is that the patients who fail to conceive may become pregnant using such embryos without having to go through a full in vitro fertilization cycle or if pregnancy occurred they could return later for another pregnancy. Here I would like to say that the spare oocytes or embryos resulting from fertility treatments may be used for oocyte donation or embryo donation to another woman or couple and embryos may be created, frozen and stored specifically for transfer and donation by using donor eggs and sperm. Also oocyte preservation can be used for women who are likely to lose their ovarian reserve due to undergoing chemotherapy if any. Thus, cryopreservation preservation is very important. Now, egg donation. Egg donation is the process by which a woman who is usually younger provides eggs, that is ova or oocytes, to another person and or partner for purposes of assisted reproduction so that the recipient of the eggs can have a baby with a partner or using donor sperm okay the donor has given the egg the partner has given the sperm after fertilization embryo is formed now it has gone to the wife okay so the fertility egg donation process involves retrieving eggs from a woman who has normally functioning ovaries okay egg donor following egg retrieval the eggs are fertilized Okay, semen sample. So fertilized in the in vitro fertilization laboratory using sperm from the receiving couple's partner or in certain situations with a donor sperm. Ultimately inserted to the intended mother. Okay. So following fertilization in the laboratory and growth of the embryos for either three or five days. The resulting embryos are transferred to the uterus of the woman. So these are transferred to the uterus of the woman. Okay. Who wishes to carry the baby? If a pregnancy is established, the receiving woman becomes the mother, carrying the developing baby through the full term of the pregnancy and childbirth with all the joys of experience that this affords. Okay. With egg donation as an infertility treatment, thousands of couples have become parents with assistance. A couple may choose to know the identity of the woman donating the eggs and vice versa. Or the parties may choose to remain anonymous. Occasionally, a woman will have a younger sister, niece or friend to donate eggs for them to use. Remember, egg donation is a selfless act, a gift of life. If you can, then you should donate eggs. Okay, you will receive the blessing of the couple. So, sperm retrieval procedures. What are the sperm retrieval procedures? In some individuals, spermatozoa may not be present in the ejaculate. This condition is called azoospermia. This can be either due to problems in sperm production itself or due to obstruction to the flow of semen during ejaculation. Okay, 
Thus, the reproductive tract obstruction can be acquired as a result of infection, trauma, iatrogenic injury during surgeries or they may be due to congenital abnormalities such as congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens and others. Okay. So the techniques appointed for sperm retrieval are as follows. They are PESA, MESS, TESA and TES. Okay. So first of all PESA Percutaneous Epididymal Sperm Aspiration or simply PESA. This PESA okay, does not require a surgical excision okay, because in PESA a small needle is a small needle okay, is passed directly into the head of the epididymis through the scrotal skin and the fluid is aspirated okay like this so it is inserted and ultimately one can aspirate the fluid and hence the name percutaneous epididymal sperm aspiration the embryologist then retrieves the sperm cells from the fluid and prepares them for intracytoplasmic sperm injection now, microsurgical epididymal sperm aspiration or MESA. Okay. So, MESA, okay. It is or microsurgical epididymal sperm aspiration or MESA is used in conditions like obstructive azospermia and it involves dissection of the epididymis under the operating microscope and incision of a single tubule okay fluid spills from the epididymal tubule and pools in the epididymal bed and finally the pooled fluid is then aspirated this pooled fluid okay after its aspiration because the epididymis is richly vascularized this technique invariably leads to contamination by blood cells that may affect sperm fertilizing capacity in vitro. Okay. So this is MESA or microsurgical epididymal sperm aspiration. Okay. So it is under open microscope dissection and this part is taken up and aspiration is done. Now comes testicular sperm extraction. TESA, TESA, okay. The testicular sperm extraction is a surgical biopsy of the testis. The biopsy tissue is then processed in the embryology laboratory, okay. It is dissected and then it is processed in the embryological laboratory, okay. And the sperm cells extracted are used for ICSI and ultimately gets implanted. Okay. Now PESA that is testicular sperm aspiration. The testicular sperm aspiration or PESA is performed by inserting a needle in the testis and aspirating fluid and tissue with negative pressure. The aspirated tissue is then processed in the embryology laboratory and the sperm cells extracted are used for intracytoplasmic sperm injection okay now tessa versus tess so what is what one should use see what i'm i i will say now is by the research techniques okay by the different research papers so there has always been a debate as which one out of the tessa and tessa is better at obtaining sperms for icsi technique Many non-neurologists called andrologists prefer TESA, that is the testicular sperm aspiration, given that they are not surgically trained or they have limited surgical training. But some researchers say otherwise. These other researchers or some researchers say that 
the testicular sperm extraction or tesse is markedly superior to tessa that is testicular sperm aspiration so testicular sperm extraction according to some researchers is markedly superior to testicular sperm aspiration at obtaining serum and in terms of the quantity and subsequent motility of the sperm fluid okay or the sperm found so this means that there is a better chance of cryopreservation of sperms obtained by testicular sperm extraction rather than testicular sperm aspiration and thus such cryopreserved sperm can be used in subsequent cycles rather than the patient having to go through another testicular sperm extraction or testicular sperm aspiration procedure okay now alternatives to ivf artificial insemination artificial insemination or ai is the deliberate introduction of sperm into a female's cervix or uterine cavity for the purpose of achieving a pregnancy through in vivo fertilization by means other than sexual intercourse okay it is a fertility treatment that is that is this artificial insemination is a fertility treatment for humans and it is even a common practice in animal breeding including dairy cattle and pigs now artificial insemination has actually four sub types first of all intrauterine insemination iui intrauterine insemination is performed by introducing a small sample of prepared sperm into the uterine cavity with a fine uterine catheter this process usually requires mild stimulation with follicle stimulating hormone to produce 2 to 3 mature follicles follicular tracking is essential to avoid over or under stimulation the success rate of this procedure ranges between 15 and 20% in top fertility units basically when the sperm sample contains around 10 to 15 or 10 to 20 million sperm milliliter of sperm then one can go for intrauterine insemination as a process of artificial insemination now the other techniques of artificial insemination are intracervical insemination intrauterine tuboperitoneal insemination and lastly intratubal insemination so these four are basically techniques used for artificial insemination surrogacy surrogacy is considered as one of the many assisted reproductive technologies okay surrogacy is an arrangement often supported by legal agreement whereby a woman that is the surrogate mother agrees to bear a child for another person or persons who will become the child's parents after birth okay people may seek a surrogacy arrangement when pregnancy is medically impossible when pregnancy risks are too dangerous for the intended mother or when a single man or a male couple wish to have a child okay so what in ivf the intended mother is implanted with this embryo okay but in surrogacy okay what this is gestational carrier i will soon say from the internal mother this embryo this ovum are taken they are fertilized ultimately this embryo is implanted to the gestational carrier which is surrogate okay so surrogacy may be either traditional surrogacy or gestational carrier surrogacy or gestational surrogacy okay so surrogacy may be either traditional or gestational which are differentiated by the genetic origin of the egg okay gestational surrogacy tends to be more common than its traditional counterpart and is considered less legally complex traditional surrogacy 
a traditional surrogacy also known as partial natural or straight surrogacy is the one where the surrogate's egg is fertilized in vivo by by the intended fathers or a donor sperm insemination of the surrogate can be either through natural or artificial insemination okay stress here that it is the surrogate's egg okay so using the sperm of the donor results in a child that is not genetically related to the intended parents and if the intended father's sperm is used in the insemination the resulting child is genetically related to both the intended father and the surrogate so here the ova belongs to the surrogate okay now about the gestational surrogacy or gestational carrier surrogacy Gestational surrogacy, also known as host or full surrogacy, which was first achieved in 1986, takes place when an embryo created by IVF technology is implanted in a surrogate mother, sometimes called as a gestational carrier. Here, this is the couple say they want a children. The mother, intended mother, will give the egg to the carrier. Intended father will give the sperm. Ultimately, it will result in the gestational surrogacy. That is, they will go and fertilize in a say lab, and ultimately, the embryo will be transplanted into a gestational carrier. Okay. So, this is what gestational surrogacy is basically. The gestational surrogacy has several forms, and in each form, the resulting child is genetically unrelated to the surrogate. That is, the gestational surrogacy. the embryo may be created using the intended father's sperm and the intended mother's egg or the embryo may be created using the intended father's sperm and the donor's egg or by other ways here as we do not use the uh, surrogate mother's ova and we use the ova from the intended mother only so the child is genetically unrelated to the surrogate mother okay now fertility tourism fertility tourism also referred to as reproductive tourism is a type of medical tourism in which both men and women travel abroad or to another region within the same country seeking state of the art in fertility treatment such as in vitro fertilization and chromosome testings chromosome testing such as pre genetic screening and these things okay The main reasons for fertility tourism are legal prohibitions or regulations of the sought procedure in the home country, the non-availability of a procedure in the home country, as well as lower costs in the destination country. The main procedures sought are in vitro fertilization and donor insemination, but also surrogacy. I must mention here that the India. is a very like good center for reproductive tourism the costs of ivf is um, generally less than that of the other developed nations and the pregnancy chances are also more so india is a sort of destination also there are other countries but as i am an indian i am saying about it so in vitro fertilization the origin so how it all began let's have a look let's go retro louis joy brown was born on 25th of july 1978 at oldham general hospital in oldham england it was by plain cesarean section that louis joy brown was delivered by registrar dr john webster her birth weight was 5 pounds and 12 ounces which is around 2.6 kilograms they are the parents of louis joy brown she is the louis joy brown the first baby produced by ivf or in a way the first test tube baby 
Louis Brown's parents, Mrs. Leslie Brown and Mr. John Brown, had been trying to conceive for nine years. Mrs. Leslie Brown faced complications of blocked fallopian tubes, and hence she was not being able to conceive naturally, and ultimately she went for in vitro fertilization. Okay. On 10th of November 1977. Mrs. Leslie Brown underwent a procedure later to become known as the in vitro fertilization or IVF developed by Dr. Patrick Christopher Stipto, Sir Robert Geoffrey Edwards, and embryologist come nurse Miss Jean Purdy. Although the media referred to Louis Brown as a test tube baby, her conception actually took place in a petri dish. He is Dr. Patrick Christopher Stepto. Dr. Patrick Christopher Stepto, born 9th June 1930 and death on 21st of March 1988, was a British obstetrician and gynecologist and a pioneer of fertility treatment. She is respected Miss Jean Marian Party Madam. She was born on 25th of April 1945 and she were, her death occurred on 16th of March 1985. She was the mother of IVF technology. So Miss Jean Marian Purdy was a British nurse and embryologist and a pioneer of fertility treatment. Miss Jean Purdy was the first to see the embryonic cells dividing which ultimately led to the birth of Louis Joy Brown, the first test tube baby. That is Miss Jean Marian Purdy first saw that fertilized egg, which was to become Louis Joy Brown, was dividing to make new cells. Okay. Miss Jean Purdy was a co-founder of the Bourne Hall Clinic, Cambridgeshire in 1980. But her role there and in the development of in vitro fertilization was ignored for 30 years. But finally, her role was acknowledged. Miss Purdy was a co-author on 26 papers with Dr. Stipto and Dr. Edwards and 370, that is 370 IVF children were conceived during her career. It is worth mentioning that she once took a leave in order to see for her like ill mother at that time her as she was very important to the lab the the conception of the babies halted in during that time she was so so important sir robert geoffrey edwards born 27th of september 1925 death 10th of april 2013 sir robert geoffrey edwards was an english physiologist and pioneer in reproductive medicine and in vitro fertilization in particular. Sir Robert Geoffrey Edwards was the founding editor-in-chief of human reproduction in 1986. Sir Robert Geoffrey Edwards was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2010 for being a co-founder for the development of in vitro fertilization. It is worth mentioning that Dr. Patrick Christopher Stipto and Miss Jean Marian Purdy were not eligible for consideration as both of them were dead and as the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. So the Nobel Prize was granted only to Sir Robert Geoffrey Edwards in 2010 for physiology or medicine for instituting in vitro fertilization technique. She is Natalie Brown. She is Louis Brown. Okay. So Louis Brown's younger sister, Natalie Brown, was also conceived through IVF four years later and became, that is, Natalie Brown became the world's 14th child after conception by in vitro fertilization. In May 1999, Natalie, she is Natalie, 
Natalie Brown was the first human born after conception by IVF to give birth herself without IVF. She was she took birth through IVF, but she gave birth naturally. Okay, she didn't use IVF. She gave birth naturally. In two thousand four, Louis Brown. She is Louis Brown. In during her marriage day, that is the day of her marriage. In two thousand four. Okay. In two thousand four, Louis Brown married nightclub doorman Wesley Mullinder, Mr. Wesley Mullinder, and Doctor Edwards. Okay, that is Dr. Sir Robert Jeffrey Edwards attended their wedding. He was also her godfather. Okay, Louis and Molinder's first son, conceived naturally, was born on twenty December two thousand six. So even though she was born by IVF, but she gave birth in a natural way. Now, he is Mr. Alistair Macdonald, and he was the first IVF baby boy. So Louis Brown was the first IVF baby as well as the first IVF female baby, but Alistair Macdonald, the mother of Alistair, Mr. Alistair Macdonald, was the first baby boy. Alistair Mac, Mr. Alistair Macdonald was born on 14th of January 1979. Was the world's first in vitro fertilization baby boy. Now, uh, basically, previously some religious issues were also there, so I will like to say one thing. Coming precisely one decade after the publication of Pope Paul VI's prophetic encyclical *Human Vitae*, the initial Catholic response to baby Louis was ambiguous. Just days before named Pope John Paul I. Albino Luciani expressed his best wishes to the baby, suggesting that the parents may have great merit before God for what they have decided on, and asked the doctors to carry out. This tube baby birth gives hope to fifteen thousand. A paper cut of that time. Louis Brown with her mother Leslie Brown. A mother's love is something that no one can explain. It is made of deep devotion and of sacrifice and pain. It is endless and unselfish. An enduring calm, what may for nothing can destroy it or take that love away. These famous lines were said by Helen Steiner Rice. This is Himanshu Shekhar Gogoi. Thanks and Namaskar. And you are watching Namaskar Physiology. Stay safe. Stay happy. And be hopeful. And remember. You are great. Thank you.